All right, let's get started. Okay, so first off, some housekeeping. So homework number four is graded. It's on the cart. Please do me a favor and pick that up sometime this week. Preferably, if you could pick that up before Friday. Um, I have a homework in concrete design that's coming in on Friday. So if you could please try and get that off the cart earlier this week, you know, earlier the better, that would be great. Homework number five is currently being graded, uh, but that should be somewhat quick. Uh, I should definitely get that back to you at least by the time we come back from spring break. Remember when we come back from spring break, we have exam review on Monday and we review or we have our exam on Wednesday. Now, let's talk about housekeeping for the class. After today, we'll actually be done with columns in class. What I've done is this. Um, so today we're going to discuss how you determine K factors for columns and frames. And what I did is I uploaded a, a video. It, it actually was a lot shorter um, th than I would expect. The video is only about 30 minutes long, but it goes through a start to finish column design problem for a column in a, in a frame. It's very representative and it actually went pretty smooth. So today we'll discuss how to get the K values for columns and frames, and then that video ties everything together. Um, so when we come back from, uh, from break, we'll have uh, exam Monday, or exam review Monday, exam Wednesday, and then Friday we start into beams. There's only one topic left associated with columns, and that's local buckling. And I think probably what I'll do is just post an example on how would you handle local buckling. It's really not hard, it's just there's a couple extra calcs that you have to do, and it's really not that big of a deal, so I, I, I'm going to make that go a little faster. Now, a um, uh, couple other things. Uh, I mentioned those hints on homework number six. One thing I'll mention on problem three, I think it is, um, when you look up the K values for problem three, be very careful what K values you look up particularly in regards to the x-axis. The symbols on the homework match the symbols that are in that, uh, in that chart uh, in the back of the commentary, but don't just look at, oh, well, that's fixed. I mean, make sure that you're paying attention because one of them looks like it's a totally fixed support and it's not really because it matches the symbol in the spec. So just make sure you're, you're watching out for that. Everybody good? Okay, so today we're gonna discuss columns and frames. Um, the, again, the, and I mentioned this last time, but the, really the big difference between K factors for individual columns and K factors for columns in frames is, the pre, is, is how you determine K. That's, that's really the big difference. Um, with singular columns, you can just look it up. For columns in frames, you have to do a little bit of figuring. So first off, um, it would help if I turn the remote on. Okay. So like I said, the, the, the calculation of K, that's the, the challenge. I want to be absolutely clear, though, that everything else is exactly the same. The method one, method two, method three, everything is the same. Checking local buckling, none of that changes. The only thing that changes is K. Okay? Now, in steel design, we deal with two types of frames uh, that, that we're talking about when we say columns and frames, and that's braced frames uh, and moment frames. So, to be clear, the, the columns that I'm talking about, when I say a column in a frame, I'm not talking about any old column in the building. Any one of these columns by themselves, these interior columns in the building, can be treated as singular columns in, you know, in, a, in any situation. The, the columns that are in the frames, when I say columns and frames, I'm talking about the system that is intended to withstand lateral load events. So, for instance, if I'm talking about a, this frame, really all I'm talking about are like these columns. And the same thing back here and, and on the sides of the building. Everything else I can treat as an individual column by itself because these columns are part of the system that is meant to restrain lateral load. So, it's, so these columns are acting integrally with those beams and those braces to resist that lateral load. If I'm talking about, let's say, a moment frame, it's a little bit uh, harder to see, but if you look at this image, does everybody kind of see how these columns and these beams right here, see how they're just a little beefier than these columns and beams over here? Does everybody see that? 
That's because these columns and beams are, are that, that lateral load resisting system. This is a moment frame. The difference, obviously, between a brace frame and a moment frame is that the brace frame includes these actual physical braces, whereas the moment frame just uses these stockier beams uh, and columns to resist that load. Um, the upside to using a moment frame is that you have open space, so it makes the architect happy. You don't have a big brace in the middle of the wall. The downside is that the beams themselves, the columns themselves, and the connections uh, tend to be a little more expensive. So it's a trade-off, and so you as the structural engineer really, for the most part, just need to be able to uh, uh, assess both. Now what really makes uh, a uh, braced frame and a moment frame different, like I said, are the connections. So what you see over here on the left is what we refer to uh, in the business as a simple shear connection. This is how any regular old beam and any regular old column are connected uh, in structures. And you can always identify a simple shear connection by the presence of bolts only along the web. So uh, the idea uh, behind this is that the web in an I-beam uh, or a W shape or what have you, uh, the web is primarily what transmits shear and the, um, the flanges are primarily what transmit moment. So if you want to take this back to a structural analysis uh, point of view, a simple shear connection would be something that would be idealized, maybe something like this or a, as a roller. Because if you remember from structural analysis, uh, hinges or rollers can uh, withstand forces, but they can't withstand moments. Whereas a moment connection, you can see it's a little different because not only is the, flan or is the web connected, but the flange is connected as well. So for instance, the way this connection is working, you can see the web and the flanges have been welded to this plate, and then that entire plate, uh, and that, that entire section is connected to the column. This particular connection is intended to transmit not just shear, but moment as well. So if you want to think of a structural analysis equivalent, what we're talking about is really more something like this, like a fixed end. Remember, fixed ends have uh, force and moment reactions. Now, that's not technically accurate, but that can give you kind of an idea uh, of, of what we're talking about. Is everybody okay with me so far? Okay. Now, I want to go back to this. So this is the, uh, the table uh, in the... Uh, uh, in the spec that lists K values. And for this discussion, I'm just using theoretical values just so that we can all kind of see what's going on from a theoretical perspective. We're going to adjust what we do to account for real life uh, scenarios here in a second. But I want to go back to some of these cases because I want to highlight a couple of them. So what we've got here are some uh, K values for single columns. And these boundary conditions are idealized. Remember, one of the things we uh, talked about in structural analysis is that no support condition in this world is perfectly fixed or perfectly pinned. We're always somewhere in between, right? Remember us discussing that? So I want to look at, let's say, case A and case B. So case A is a support condition where you have a fixed support on the bottom and a fixed support on the top. And for this support, or for this boundary condition, we have a K value of 0 0.5, okay? Now, case B is pretty much the same on the bottom. We have a fixed condition, but instead of having a fixed support on the bottom, we have a pin, or a fixed support on the top, we have a pin support on the top. And so this is K is 0 0.7, okay? So basically what we're saying is that um, if you have a, a column that is you know, rigidly restrained on both ends, the K value is 0.5. But if you allow that top to freely rotate, well, our K value increases from 0.5 to 0.7. Well, this is a, a support condition that's perfectly rigid up top, and this is a support condition that's perfectly pinned on top. So what if we have a situation like this, where instead of having, so we have a fixed boundary condition on the bottom, but instead of having a condition that's perfectly fixed or perfectly pinned, we have a bunch of beams and columns framing into that point. Well, what is this? Is this perfectly fixed or perfectly pinned? Well, I, I say it's neither. It's probably somewhere in between, 
right? Those, I mean, think those beams and columns are framing into that particular point. So if I take that point and wrench on it, well, the bigger those beams and columns are, the harder it is to twist, right? So really what K is for this situation depends on my beams and columns framing into that joint. So if I had a fixed boundary condition on the bottom and I had, let's say, a braced frame, well, my K value is probably going to be somewhere in between 0.5 and 0.7. Whereas if I had a pin boundary condition on the bottom, well, I'm probably going to be somewhere between this and and this, where I have a pin, pin, pin column. And so this is K is, sorry, K is 1. So the long story short is that if I've got a braced frame, my K value is probably somewhere between 0.5 and 1. I don't quite know what it is for a generic frame because I've got to know what's framing into it. I've got to know the stiffness is framing into it. For a moment frame, well, you can look at uh, similar cases uh, in that table, and if we have a fixed support, you can see how the K value is going to be anywhere between 1 and 2. And if we have a pin support, it's going to be anywhere between 2, and it, it can actually theoretically go uh, theoretically up until infinity, even though practically uh, it doesn't. So when it's all said and done, if we try and discretize this into brace frames and moment frames, and analytically what I'm saying is that a braced frame is one where the column doesn't sway, and a moment frame is where it can sway. Um, so if you ever hear me say side sway inhibited or side sway uninhibited, that's what I'm talking about. So braced frames, I propose that for braced frames, K could be anywhere between 0.5 and 1. Whereas for a moment frame, K would start at 1, but it could be anything larger than that. Okay? Everybody okay with that? Now here's the thing, um, the, the math that is required to actually determine what K is, is pretty nasty, okay? We start off by determining what's called a rotational stiffness parameter. Now in structural analysis, you all remember that EI over L was kind of an important term to determine how strong a beam was. Remember the bigger the EI was, the less it would deflect, right? Remember that? So the bigger the EI over L is, the stiffer the, the element is. But see, we're looking at steel, right? So the E for the columns and the E for the girders are all the same because E for steel is 29,000 KSI. So what I'll do is I'll factor out the E values and cancel it. And so all I have to worry about is I over L. It's kind of similar to a uh, moment distribution. Remember how we would compute those I over L values to get that relative stiffness? It's kind of the same thing. Now, once you get these values in order to accurately, you know, actually determine what K is, here's the equations. They're pretty nasty. In fact, I would challenge anybody in this room to just take this equation and see if you can solve for K. Just algebraically. You, you can't, okay? It, it's, it's pretty nasty. Same thing with this one. There's no way to take these equations and just isolate K by themselves. They're, they're, they're pretty nasty. Um, there's really only two ways to go about it. Now, the first way to go about it, uh, which is the way that I do the, the solutions uh, uh, for the homework, is I use goal seek. Like, I'll, I'll, put to get, I'll plug in G A, G B, and then I'll have it iterate and figure out what K needs to be so that this equation needs to be zero or that equation needs to be zero. And that's how I do it on the homework. Um, I don't expect you to do that on the homework, and you certainly can't do that on the exam. And that's why I've given you this. Okay, so first off, this, it's not like what I gave you uh, with this handout is not in the manual. Okay, so first off, um, if you go to the table in the manual where the K values are and you look to the page next over, there they are. And there's actually two of them. There's one for brace frames and there's one for moment frames. You actually don't need the one for braced frames, and that'll become clear when we do when you review that video, uh, the one that has the column design example. Again, if you did not get uh, the hard copy, they're here on the chair. Um, now, here, here's the thing. The way that this chart works is what you do is you compute a, what's this G value. You compute a G value 
for either end of the column. And so you'll get a G value, let's say, for the bottom end of the column and a GI for the, or a G value for the top end of the column. And then you strike a line. Well, the page in the manual is kind of curved and the table's a little tiny. So what I've done is I've blown that up. I made it really big on this handout so you've got a little bit more room. So hence, that's why I've, uh, why I've given you this. Um, but yeah, th what this is, this is what, uh, if you hear me refer to this as an alignment chart, this is uh, what's called an alignment chart. It just makes the solution of these equations a lot easier to determine values for, uh, for K. Now, a couple things for, uh, for computing these G values. So there are some special cases. So first off, um, if you have a fixed support, well, fixed supports theoretically have infinite stiffness. So theoretically, the G value would be zero, but this is where we start to adjust for real life. Remember, there's no such thing as being perfectly uh, fixed. So theoretically, the G value at the bottom end of a column that's uh, fixed would be zero, but we're going to take G to be one. Whereas uh, on the bottom end of the column, if we have a, uh, the bottom end that's pinned, well, pinned ends have zero rotational stiffness. So one over zero would theoretically give you a G value that's infinity. Well, we're not going to use a G value of infinity. We're going to use a recommended G value of 10. So that's where we start to bring in the real life aspect, if you will, uh, for, for our G value. So for, for instance, we're going to look at an example here in a second. And so we're going to have a G value here, here, and here. And the G value on the bottom is going to be 10 because it's a pinned, uh, pinned in at the bottom. Everybody okay with that? Now, when we, um, when we, well, not we, I mean it was the structural engineering community back in the 60s, uh, derived these, uh, these you know, nasty equations for the, these uh, K values, they made a lot of assumptions. Okay? Some of the assumptions are pretty reasonable. Uh, for instance, like prismatic members, well, this member is a W14 by 132 from start to end, so it doesn't suddenly become a W36 by 800, so that, that's pretty uh, reasonable. Um, all the call, or you know, we neglect axial force in the girders, uh, so on and so forth. There's some pretty reasonable uh, uh, assumptions, but some of them are, uh, can be adjusted. So one of the adjustments that can be made uh, is to account or to adjust these uh, parameters for elastic behavior. Remember, there's two reasons why real column behavior deviates from ideal column behavior. One of them is imperfections, and the other is residual stresses, because residual stresses begin the onset of inelastic behavior a lot sooner than we would think. So adjusting this elastic behavior uh, condition is really kind of important. Unfortunately, there's a really easy way to do that. What we do is we look at our stresses, and what we say is, well, if we're in any elastic stress condition, remember how that, uh, that slope of that uh, stress strain curve sort of does that? Remember how we go from an, an E to that tangent modulus? So what we do is we replace our um, column stiffness with this E sub T, factor that out, and we, we call this term tau sub b. It's the ratio of these two. And fortunately, there's a really simple equation for tau sub b. Uh, and here's your expression. It's really straightforward. If your load uh, over your yield load is less than half, then we, or less than 50%, we don't worry about it. Otherwise, we compute it using this, this really straightforward equation. Basically, the idea is this. So this is your factored load. And FYAG is how much load it would cause to yield the column. So if this ratio is larger than 50%, what the code is saying is, OK, you probably have some inelasticity that you've got to consider. So we need to, uh, uh, we need to account for that with this tau b factor. However, if that ratio is really small, that means the column really isn't seeing that much force anyways. And so tau is going to be 1. Uh, uh, just to keep uh, everybody's you know, brains turned on, we very, very, very rarely would ever use the top expression because that would mean that the column is seeing less than 50% of its yield load. And if that's the case, that column is probably way over designed and can probably be a, a lot more efficient. I mean, that would be a column that's super huge and only seeing very little load. So this, this equation is very, like we very rarely would take tau to be one. Uh, almost never. Um, everybody okay with this? 
All right, don't worry. We're gonna we're if if it's a little fuzzy, don't worry. We'll we'll practice this. Uh, one one final uh, point to mention: when we compute k values, we can determine our g uh, for either end of the column elastically. We determine tau if we need. In most cases, we will. And what we would do is go into these alignment charts with not the g values, but the tau times the g values. The only thing that's a little bit of a detail that you got to pay attention to: you never apply tau to a to a support. Because this support, you know, we're using a value of 1 or 10 anyways, really doesn't make much sense to assume that a support is behaving elastically or inelastically. It's just a support. So it's either 1 or 10. You wouldn't apply a tau uh, in that instance. Everybody okay? Right, don't worry. Let's get some practice in. Now, um, what we've got here is a, a frame, for example, 17. And this is going to give us a good bit of practice using this. Now, um, what I've got is this frame, I've got it transposed over here. So everything that you see here is over here. I just redrew it uh, on, the, uh, 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 on the whiteboard. Now, um, in order to uh, compute uh, our k values, we're going to need to compute these g values. Now, the way that G works is we're going to take the sum of I over L for the columns divided by the sum of I over L for the girders. Now, I look at these elements and right off the bat it's pretty easy to figure out how long they are. Like this one's 40 foot long, this one's 32 foot long, this one's 32, this is 12, this is 14. That's pretty easy. But what I'm going to need are some moments of inertia. And so I've got this written over here on the whiteboard just so we can track this. But before we start computing uh, G values and everything, I need some moments of inertia. So somebody tell me, what's the moment of inertia of this W24 by 68? Which means you should be breaking out your AISC 15th edition steel construction manual that everybody brought with them. Now first off, why are we using the X value and not the Y value? Because of our symbol. Remember our symbol, if the flanges are sticking out, that's the x-axis. If we see the flange and the web sticking through, that's the y-axis. So this is all x-axis conditions. I need the moments of inertia for, for each of these shapes. So let's start off with the 24 by 68. Anybody have a moment of inertia for that? 1830. Do I have a second on that? Okay. So that's the same thing here. Okay, what about um, the W24 by 55? What's its moment of inertia? 1350. Do I have a second on that? Okay, um, the columns. Okay, so this is a W14 by 132 and a W14 by 90. What's the moment of inertia for the 132? Yes, because yeah, look right here, it, that's a good question. Same symbol. Remember, that symbol is what the column looks like. So think that's the flange and then you have the, or that's the web and then you have the flanges sticking out like that. This one right here, 1830? 1530. And this one right here. $9.99. Is everybody okay with that? That's just me putting it on the board so, so everybody's, you know, can reference the same thing. Now, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to compute a G value for each of these joints because what we're going to do is we're going to look up the k values for this column and for this column. So ultimately we're going to need three g values here, here, and here. But this one's easy. What's the g value at the bottom? 10, right? So what we'll say here is gc is 10. Okay? Everybody with me so far? 
All right. Okay. Okay. So example 17. Okay. So I've got the image over here on the board. Let's start off with G values. Now remember, the way that we compute a G value is we take the sum of the I over L for the columns divided by the sum of the I over L for the girders. And that's how we compute G. Okay? So we're going to have three quantities. We're going to have a GA, a GB, and a GC, but we already know what that is. That's 10. Okay. All right. So let's take this point A first. Okay. So point A, let me ask you a question. How many columns frame into point A? How many columns? One. How many girders? Two. Okay. So here's what I propose. I propose that GA is computed as 999 inches to the fourth over 14 feet over the I over L for each of those two girders. So 1830 over 40. plus 1350 over 32. But, what's that? Did I get, the, is it 12? I, yeah, it's 12, I'm sorry, thank you. Now, but Dr. Mike, what about the units? You have inches and you have feet. That's true, but I have inches to the fourth over feet divided by inches to the fourth over feet. So everything cancels, okay? As long as the lengths are consistent and the moments of inertia are consistent, everything will cancel, okay? Now, what does this come out to be? We'll say two decimal places. Well, I don't think we need anything any more than that. What's that? I don't need 12 decimal places. I just need two. Zero point nine four. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now that's GA. What about GB? Okay. How is this going to change? Well, how many columns are framing into this point? Two. So I've got this plus that. How many girders? This plus this. Okay. So now, how's that going to work out? Well, what do we got? We got 999 inches to the fourth over 12 feet plus, what is that, what, 1530? Over what? What's the length? It's all the way over there. I'm going to need y'all's help. Now, does the denominator change at all? This, I mean, the big denominator. No, it's the same. Okay, and so what does this come out to be? Bless you. Two point one nine. Do I have a second on that? Okay. All right. Again, and the answer is unitless. There are no units associated with G values because it's just I over L and I over L all divided. Okay, so 
Here's where your alignment charts come into play. Okay? We have two columns. We have column AB. We have column BC. So let's take column AB. So we have a G value of 0 0.94 and a G value of 2.19. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that the axis on the left and the axis on the right is of the exact same scale. So it doesn't matter if you put the 0.94 on the left and the 2.19 on the right or vice versa because you'll get the same answer. And so what you're going to do is you're going to locate the 0.94, let's say, on the left, and the 2.19 on the right, and then strike a line and tell me what you're getting for K. Now remember, this is KX. One point four five I'm hearing enough four fives to go ahead and call it and I can already hear the questions you know what happens if we're on a homework or an exam and I put 1.46 and the answer is actually 1.45 I'm going to take your homework or your exam rip it up in front of you and make you go sit in the corner You, you can just leave the building. <laughs> um, look, the way I set up my solutions, I, I always allow for a little bit of variability there. I mean, if you're getting 2.7, that's wrong, okay? But if you're getting like 1.46, 1 1.47, that's fine. That's fine. It's okay. And, and a lot of this is going to be just sort of eyeballing it, so it, it's okay. It's okay. Now, let's do, let's do the next column. So column... BC. Okay, so we have a G value, so we'll call it GB of 2.19, and then the, the other value on the other end is 10. So what does this K value come out to be? See, this, this has zero rotational stiffness, so it's going to allow more rotation. So as a result, your K value should go up quite a bit. Remember, what if your K value goes up, what happens to your capacity? Like, does the column get stronger if K gets larger, or does it get weaker? Well, let's ask you this. Let me ask this. If K goes up, what happens to KL over R? And, it's, and what is KL over R? That's your slenderness, right? What happens if slenderness goes up? The strength goes down. So we want that K value to get smaller. So just keep that in mind. So am I got a K value for this? 2.17? I heard enough 1.7s to go with it. Now, I actually had 1.4 on my, on my notes, but you've convinced me. You've convinced me. I mean, I, I don't have much hope for you on the exams. I'm, <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. Now, now here, here's the thing. All right, everybody with me on this? Okay, now, everything that we've done, I want to be absolutely crystal clear on this. These both assume elastic behavior. Okay, so what we're now going to do is we're going to consider inelastic behavior. Okay, the way that's going to work is we're going to take into account some properties associated with each column. So what I'm going to do on my notes is I'm going to work side by side. So over here we'll say column AB. And over here, we'll say column 
BC. Now, um, help me out. Uh, column A, B, um, what's the size of that? So W14 by what? 90. And this one's a W14 by 132. Did I get that right? Okay. Now, does anybody have their notes? Can they tell me what is the load on each of these columns? PD? That's it. Oh, okay. You want to No, no, no. They are factored. Hold on. Did did I did I, did I did I whoops that that's I'm sorry that's a typo we'll take off point zero two on the mistake counter that's supposed to be PU and PU I'm sorry sorry we'll tell you what we'll go point zero six because I'm feeling generous <laughs> point one that's it we're not going past that. That was 1050 kips, and this was 1370. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay, um, we're going to assume both of these have 50 KSI. Bless you. But I am going to need a gross area. So what's the gross area of a 14 by 90 and the gross area of 14 by 132? Which, by the way, at this point, I'm sort of just like asking for these properties. Does everybody feel comfortable looking all this stuff up? Like if I say, what's the BF of a 10 by 49? That everybody's okay with finding that? For the first one, 26.5. And this one over here. Okay. All right. So... What we're going to do is determine whether or not we need to compute a tau value. So the first thing that we do is we compute a PU over FYAG. So that's 1050 kips over 50 KSI times 26.5 inches squared. Now what are the units for this calculation going to be? What's that? There are no units. Exactly right. It's completely you know, unitless. Blech. And what does this come out to be? I really about grabbed the Expo marker to write on the screen. That would have been close. 0 0.790, or 79 what, 2? All right, I'm going to carry that one out one more. Do I have a second on that? Okay, all right, so let's be clear. What this is saying is this column is loaded to about 79% of its yield load, okay? So this column is seeing some pretty hefty load. If this value is ever less than 0.5, then tau is 1. You aren't considering any elasticity because the column isn't, doesn't have any load on it. Um, however, if this value is over 0.5. Everybody watch this because this is kind of important. The tau value is computed as follows. Now watch this. This is important so you don't waste your time. Okay, so here's the expression. And I can see some of you are like, okay, 4 times 1050 divided by this. How about this? 4 times that fraction times the quantity 1 minus that fraction. We already know that fraction is 0.792. So don't waste your time. Just do this. That make sense? Because 4 times that fraction is 4 times this. I mean, look at this and look at that. It's just that times 4. And 1 minus this is just 1 minus that. And so what does this come out to be? 
0 0.659 seconds. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the chart. Only before we went in with what, GA and GB, we're going to go in with tau GA, tau GB. So 0 0.659 times 0 0.94. 0 0.659 times 2.19. And so what do those come out to be? What's the first one? Just two. 0 0.62 and the second one. Seconds? All right. So for these, what is Kx? So now you're going to go back into the alignment chart, only your G values are going to drop a bit. 1.6? Did you say 1.6? What, wait, what? One point three? I've got one point three in my notes. Okay. Oh. All right. This is inelastic. All right. I need everybody to pay attention up here. This is kind of important. All right. How does this compare to before? Everybody watch up here. Watch up here. All right. What did we get before for this column? 1.45. So by including this tau value, what did it do to our K? Lowered it. Okay. So what does that do to KL over R? If KL over R get or if K gets smaller, what happens to KL over R? It gets smaller. And if KL over R gets smaller, what happens to our capacity? Does the column get stronger or weaker? Stronger. So by including tau, we are able to squeak out more capacity with this column. So always use it. However, you got to be careful when you're using it. And if, like, what do you mean by that? Let's go to column BC. Same process. PU over FYAG. So can somebody just tell me what that comes out to be? It's the same problem, just different initial values. 0 0.706. Do I have a second on that? All right. So that's over 50%. So tau is 4 times that fraction times the quantity 1 minus that fraction. And what does that come out to be? 0 0.830. Now, so here's what you do. Watch this. So we have column BC. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a tau for the upper joint. So that's 0 0.830 times, what was the upper value? 2.19. What does that come out to be? 1.82. Do I have a second on that? And what about, do we do this? No. Exactly right. That is wrong. We just use... 10, okay? The reason why is, remember, go back to your frame. That is this pin support. We never apply tau to a support condition, so we always just leave it as is, okay? So now,
What's KX? Okay, say it. I got 2.2, 2.1. I want to get a consensus on this one. I'm hearing more people say 2.1. I think you're getting outvoted. And again, this is inelastic. Rebel over here. It is. It is 2.1 though. I mean, I'm, I actually, I goal seeked. I got 2.09. So I, I did cheat a little bit. All right. Does anybody have any questions on this? Okay. Let me show you something real quick and and set the stage for for what's going on in the uh, in the the next video. Everybody pay attention. So, <clears throat> is everybody okay with determining K for a frame? Okay, all right. So, if you understand how to design a column, and you understand how to determine K for a column in a frame, then you understand how to design columns in frames. Because all it is is taking the design stuff that we did in example 16, and taking the K stuff we just did in our previous example, and combining them. And that's it. So what I have here is an example that I go through in the video. Now, I want everybody to pay attention to this. This is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. What can you tell me about the y-axis by looking at it? Is it a brace frame or a moment frame? Brace frame. Now, what was the range for K values for brace frames? Anybody remember, like, for, for moment frames, it was anything bigger than 1. What about for brace frames? It was between 0.5 and 1. If you don't believe me, go to your K chart here in the manual, and look, there's two of them. There's one on the first page and one on the second page. This one on the first page is for brace frames. And look at the range. K goes from 0.5 to 1. Does everybody see that? Now, Here's the thing. Look at, look at here. We're designing this column, and I've given you all the information for the girders and the columns, but you don't have a clue what's going on, on the y-axis other than it's a braced frame. And that's all I've told you. So you have to have a k value along that y-axis for designing, but you don't have any idea about the bracing. What would you assume? Say it again. Use k equals 1. In the video, I discussed why that's a valid assumption as well. Yes. No, that's correct. This one's correct. Yeah, this one's right. I apologize. All right, everybody. All right. We have the online lecture for Wednesday, and then that's it for spring break. You have homework six due when you come back. I would not put that off. Um, I would also not put off watching some of this stuff because we're going to use a lot of this stuff in homework number seven, okay? Um, when we come back from spring break after our exam, it's nothing but beans because there's really nothing else to say with columns. I might do a quick review when we come back just to make sure everybody remembers what city, state, and zip code we're in when it comes to steel design. But I don't see you all for two weeks. That's all I got. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. All right. Friday you come back. I would honestly, I would try and do it sooner rather than later. If you got time this week, I would do it this week. That's all I got.